worship, August the 9th, Mosaic United Methodist Church in Oklahoma City. Whether you are a regular member in person or online, no matter where you are around the world, you are welcome here. Our prelude this morning is, was recorded um, in upstate New York this past month by our choir director, Gwenda Sharp, and her son-in-law, Luke. Mosaic, what is our purpose? The purpose of Mosaic United Methodist Church is to welcome all to experience the radical love, the radical love, the radical love of God. As together we create a beautiful community of justice, compassion, and faith. Mosaic is a widening circle, a widening circle, a widening circle of all nationalities, races, classes, ages, families, gender identities, and expressions, sexual orientations, abilities, and faith. And we welcome you just as you are. Welcome, and Jerry has our land acknowledgement this morning. He also has an introduction as we have a guest with us today. Oh, Jerry, you're muted. Jerry, can you hear me? You're muted. I'm sorry. I am no sorry. problem. <laughs> I would like to. I'd like to extend. I'd like everybody to extend a warm welcome to my friend Mary Boardman. Mary comes to us from North Dakota. She is a dyed in the wool Methodist and a and a long, long, uh, t very talented uh, praise band leader. And uh, don't ask how I found her. She found us at Mosaic. So, welcome, Mary. Thank you for joining us. Mosaic gladly welcomes all and acknowledges that the land on which we meet in Oklahoma City is, was, and always will be native land. This land was once inhabited by the Spiro peoples. We acknowledge these indigenous tribes to Oklahoma, the Wichitas, Caddo's, Plains Apaches, and the Quapaws as the original custodians of the land in this place. 
We respect those who came here as a result of the Trail of Tears, the Choctaw, Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, and Seminole people. We grieve the violence done to native language, culture, and personhood. One of Mosaic's core values is reconciliation, and we embrace the ongoing work of reconciliation among all God's creation. Thank you, Jerry. We begin our worship with um, sort of a gathering, and even though we're not gathering in person, and isn't this uh, so unusual? We've been going for so many weeks, and we are eager to get back together in person. Um, but we are, um, we're, you know, we're watching the statistics, we are um, listening to the experts, and we're taking it slow. And I think that most of you appreciate that, but we are so eager to be back in person. Um, and, but we still want to sing this song, so let's join together. like that song. Let's join in our call to worship, Mosaic. In the midst of all that tosses us to and fro, in the heart of what makes us most afraid, God gathers, God gathers us, us together. together, grounding us in our collective power, nurturing our faith, drawing upon wells of wisdom, ancient and new. Our spirits, our spirits are, renewed are renewed in the presence, in the presence of God. Of God. We take heart. We share the we load, load together. together. We trust that fear will not overpower us. Courage is our inheritance, a legacy, legacy of, the of the faithful. Thanks be to God, the spirit of liberation, who upholds us. Amen. And we have today some new words to an old familiar hymn. Please join us in the singing of Jesus' Wondrous Words of Grace. Jesus' wondrous words of grace, welcome all to God's embrace. Welcome if you're rich or poor, if you're knocking at the door, if you come from far away, if you need a place to stay, if you suffer want or pain, you are welcome in God's reign. Do you live in fear and doubt? Do you seek to leave some out? Do you think that some can't get to the 
table God has set. Think there is no room for you. Jesus says you're welcome to. Think you're different, sinful, odd. You are welcome, child of God. Jesus says to all the church, Welcome in the ones who search. Welcome in the ones who mourn. Welcome in the tired and worn. Welcome those who live in fear. Welcome in the sinners here. As you do to these you see, so you also welcome me. At this time, if you'll make sure your kids are um, gathered around the screen, we'll have a time um, with the children. Sunday, I want to talk about one of our favorite subjects, being sarcastic, rules. I know. And when I say that, you probably aren't like, oh, yay, I'm so excited, rules, I love rules. You probably are like, oh, Miss Addison, rules, I hate rules. Rules stink. But rules are all around us. They're in everything we do, everywhere we go. There's always rules all around us. Like maybe if you were on the playground or at a park, you have to wait your turn before someone goes down the slide. And maybe sometimes you can like only run on the grass, but not on the concrete. And you have to share the swings with your classmates if you're at school. And then when the teacher blows the whistle, that means it's time to come inside. That's a rule. Or like when we want to go outside just in general there are rules that keep us safe like you have to hold your grown-ups hand when you cross the street you have to look both ways before you're walking like walking on the sidewalk and not the road those kinds of rules rules are all around us and it makes us wonder does God have rules hmm well I will tell you that a long, long, long time ago, God thought we might need some rules. And so God sent down 10 rules and gave them to this guy named Moses and said, here, Moses, share these with your people. These are all of the rules. And these rules said some things like, don't lie, don't cheat, be really nice to your mom and dad and your grown-ups, like rules like that. But some time passed and some of those rules were hard to follow. And so God decided maybe we should make some new rules or more important rules. So God sent down Jesus and said, you know what? Jesus said, scratch that. There's only two really important rules. One, worship God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And number two, love your neighbor. Some days though, it's really hard to remember to love God with our heart and our mind and our soul and to love our neighbor. And it's definitely really hard to love our neighbor if they're being mean to us or they may not follow, they may not follow some rules that we think are really important. But the best part of all of this is that when we sometimes forget to love God or sometimes we forget to love our neighbor like Jesus taught us to do, God doesn't get mad at us. God doesn't love us any less. And we are God's family and God loves us so much, even when it's really hard to follow the rules. And it's an amazing gift and it has a name. It's called grace. 
Grace is when sometimes we forget to follow rules and God still loves us just as we are and doesn't think any less of us and does, isn't disappointed in us just because God knows that we can mess up sometimes, but it means we're trying and God loves us no matter what. That is what grace is. So I want us to remember it is really important to follow rules. It's really important to be a kind person. Now more than ever, um, you may know that now we have lots of rules. Like you have to wear a mask when you go out and you have to stay six feet away from people. Those are rules that keep us safe and those are really important rules and we really shouldn't break those rules. But sometimes when we break God's rules of loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves, God's not mad at us because God knows that we're trying and God gives us the grace to do better next time. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the gift of grace, for messing up and still being loved. Help us to love ourselves and others. Amen. Bye, guys. Have a great week. With us today, um, Philip Boone, and Philip is a familiar face to most of us at Mosaic. He was our children's minister a few years ago, before he and his family moved to Tulsa, and he is on staff at Boston Avenue United Methodist Church as the director of, of Mid High um, Youth. And Philip, welcome to our um, series on seeing God on the big screen or the small screen. And um, we're glad we know you have a love for. Um, for Broadway and for musicals and music and all kinds of stuff. So welcome to our series and tell us, um, well, just you, you can take it from here. Thanks so much, Scott. I have always loved Broadway and musical theater. So whenever Scott reached out to me, I, my number one musical is Les Miserables. I was originally going to sing or just do a one man show of the whole production um, for my sermon today. However, I didn't feel that you'd have three hours to spend of me just going, doing every part. So instead, I'll just talk a little bit about it. Les Miserables was a book written by Victor Hugo that was made into um, movies, made into a Broadway production in the 1980s, and um, it continues to run until this day. It is about a man by the name of Jean Valjean. He was imprisoned for 19 years 
five for stealing bread to feed his sister's family, and 14 for numerous escape attempts. When he's released on parole, he's given a yellow ticket of leave. However, that yellow ticket marks him as a former convict, so nobody gives him the time of day. Nobody, whenever, he, whenever he's walking, people scoff at him because of the yellow ticket. Nobody lets him in to spend the night or gives him food, except for Bishop Muriel. The bishop invites Valjean in, treats him with respect. He lets Valjean sleep at his house that evening. During the night, however, Valjean steals some of the bishop's silver and flees, just leaves, runs away before being captured by the police and taken back to the bishop. However, Bishop Muriel says that he gave the silver to Valjean as a gift. Not only that, but he'd forgotten to take the silver candlestick with him as well. The police ex accept the explanation and leave. The bishop then tells Valjean that he's been spared and that he should use the money that he receives from the silver to make an honest man of himself. So then eight years later, he's known as Monsieur Madeleine. He's a wealthy factory owner who has changed his life around. He's respected and he's seen as a stand-up citizen. In changing his name and taking a new identity, however, he's breached his parole and is chased and he's chased the whole show by the police inspector Javert. He spends the majority of the show looking for Valjean. There's a lot more that goes into this um, throughout their different storylines weaving in and out um, throughout this particular story. But I want to stop right there. Because we have now seen the most important character in the play or in the story. Whenever you ask someone who is the main character in Les Miserables, they'll probably usually say Jean Valjean. Some might say Javert is a, right up there as a good secondary ca character. But I'd be willing to say none of them are the most important. The most important character is to me, Bishop Muriel, the bishop. In the story, Jean Valjean was at a low point in his life. He had left prison, but was marked forever by his yellow card. The bishop's grace and compassion is probably the first time he'd seen grace since before he had been arrested. Because Bishop Muriel showed Valjean the compassion and grace and mercy Valjean turned his life around. There are plenty of stories we hear about of redemption or of an act of compassion, being able to flip somebody's life when it was going down a bad path that changed it around. But the story of Les Miserables makes me think a lot of the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, there's Jesus there's a story of Zacchaeus in the Bible. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, not particularly liked, um, probably cheated some people out of some money, so was looked down upon. Jesus was going through Jericho. And as he was going through Jericho, Zacchaeus was a short man, decided to climb a tree and watch him. I like to think he didn't climb the tree, not, he didn't climb the tree only because he was short and couldn't see, but because then he'd be alone. He wouldn't be in any, he wouldn't be bothering anybody else. Nobody would look at him with scorn and he'd be able to kind of hide from everybody else. And Jesus was riding through Jericho, looked up and saw Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, come down from there. Come down from there, invite me to your house to eat, and we will, we will share a meal. And right then Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Whenever I read certain stories, I often want to go more in their backstory. For Zacchaeus, what made 
him become the tax collector? What made him be disliked? What happened when he was younger that would make him into who he was? I would like to know about Valjean before he was arrested. What kind of person was he? You can tell that he loves his family because he stole the bread to feed his starving sister and their family. So you know that he loves the one he's close, he's close to, loves his family, and will do what he, even if it's stealing some bread or whatever, he will do whatever he can to provide for them. But other than that, what kind of a person was he? And with Zacchaeus, I want to know where he goes from there. Because the story of Zacchaeus stops whenever he says he's going to turn his life around or he's going to pay back four times the amount. We don't really see what happens to him after that. Does he continue to do that? Does he live an honest life? Does he do what is right after he promises Jesus? With Jean Valjean, we are able to see that. We know that he does become an honest man. He is well respected. He adopts Cosette after her mother Fantine dies and does everything he can for Cosette. Um, even Cosette's boyfriend at the time, who he's not a fan of, when he when he, it looks like he will die, he picks him up and, and walks him through the sewer to make sure that, um, that he is safe, that Marius is safe, even though he ne wasn't necessarily a fan of Marius to begin with. But he loves his family so much, he'll do whatever he can to make them happy. So we, so we kind of are able to see what type of a person Jean Valjean becomes after he promises the bishop, um, after he promises the bishop um, that he will be an honest man, he will do what is right. And in Les Miserables, I want to know, if Bishop Muriel hadn't done what he did, how would the rest of the story have gone? Would Valjean had eventually become who he became? Or would he have stayed on the path that he was on of stealing and just trying to get by? Bishop Muriel let him take the silverware and the candlesticks and told him to sell them. So that gave Valjean a start on becoming an honest man and being be able to have some money. So that's all it took for him. Even if Bishop Muriel had not done that, would he have eventually become who he became? It's hard to tell sometimes. When we meet somebody who is distraught, who are we in the story? I like to often think about who I am in particular stories I read. In the story of Zacchaeus, Am I the people that scoff at him, that, that don't give him the time of day? Try, probably when, he, when you see him, you go the opposite way. Or am I more in the line of what Jesus did? Now, obviously, in stories, we want to be the Jesus character, because that's the character that is doing the good. But when we think about who we are in particular stories, am I the Jesus character who invites him, invites him in, invites, invites him to eat with you with Les Miserables, and I see someone in trouble, someone who has had a difficult life, am I the person to show compassion or am I the person to say, no, I, I go away, I don't want to see you. Um, I can tell you haven't always gone on the right path. So who are we in the stories? The story of the Good Samaritan is another one. 
am I the priest or the Levite? When I see someone hurt, see someone in pain that walks around them, or am I the Samaritan that helps them get back on their feet? It's a question I often ask. At the end of the novel, Victor Hugo wrote, to love another person is to see the face of God. I absolutely love that line. To love another person is to see the face of God. Showing love and compassion, showing kindness, empathy, to me is to be the hands and feet of Jesus. To do service work, to sh show kindness in whatever ways you can, is to truly start to be like Jesus. It is to show people the gospel rather than telling them about the gospel. Telling them is all fine and good, but I want to live, and a lot of us want to live, like the song says, in um, they will know we are Christians by our love. I don't want people to know that I'm a Christian just by how much I talk about Jesus or how much I talk about God, but about in how I act. Showing compassion, showing compassion for the distraught, for the people that are having trouble in life, showing empathy, being there for them to help them get on the right track. One of my favorite quotes is a quote by Leo Buscaglia. And he said, too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. I'm, I'm going to read that one more time. Too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. This particular quote is one that I've often taken with me whenever I was teaching, whenever I would go into the classroom, working with the youth the way I have the last two years at Boston Avenue. You don't, we don't know what people are going through. And just a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring have the potential to turn somebody's life around. Maybe not always to that extreme. They, def, they all, all, all the time, a lot of times, they have the potential to at least turn somebody's day around. And every once in a while, it might be someone's life. So I want you, on this day for you to think about what ways have you shown a kind word? What ways have you shown a listening ear? What ways have you shown a smallest act of caring, just a small act of caring? And how have you helped turn somebody's day or life around, just like Bishop Muriel did, or just like Jesus did? What have you done in order to maybe help somebody turn their life around? Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And I just wanted to ask you real quick, are you, are you at the church office right now? Or? Yes, I am. Okay, because I know I saw on Facebook, you were saying you're going to the office and your <laughs> daughter said, the closet? I mean, I guess you must be working out of a closet. Yeah, today, house. well, yeah. I usually come in about once a week. Uh -huh. And whenever I'm at home, my office is the closet. So yeah. normally, hey, so nor <laughs> normally I do um, work in the closet. So she knows that and she, she can come in whenever and bother me. <laughs> so yeah how are your kids here i just i just put a picture of them um taken just this week by your <laughs> partner um 
how are they? How's your family doing? Give us a quick update. Uh, they're good. Um, Courtney luckily does not have COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, she tested negative. She's, um, but we're all healthy and doing well. She is um, working once or twice a week usually, and they often have positive tests come in. Mm-hmm. So she's never a hundred percent sure <laughs> right. how it's going. Um, but she likes her job. I'm I'm glad that I have at, at this moment uh, I have the possibility of working from home. Mm-hmm. So that's made life a lot easier, especially because the girls haven't been going to daycare since March. Mm, yeah, um, and that drives that drives us crazy. Yeah, but, <laughs> but precious um, angels, look at well. those precious angels. <laughs> what do you What do you mean that drives you crazy? Just look at that. They're angels. <laughs> oh yeah, Adele, yeah. Lee is. Lee, luckily, Lee's, Lee is a really good um, comed, comedic. She's good for comic relief. Whenever we're mad at Adele, she'll do a funny walk or try to, which will prob- try to settle us down, which will probably be what she does throughout her life. That's probably anytime we're mad at Adele, she'll, hey, look at me. <laughs> I just wanted to say a couple of things because you mentioned Leo Viscalia. Um have you read any of his books? I have not. Oh, then you need to. I, so when I was in ninth grade in an English class, we were given a quote of his and we were, had to write like a, an essay, three uh-huh. page essay. And that quote so uh, stuck with me, I guess. I, I found a, a book of his in, um, and bought it. It was called Living, Loving, and Learning. And what I didn't realize, he, he was an educator and he um, uh-huh. ended up teaching um, – at a university. And so he spoke to a lot of teachers and probably other groups as well. But this book, Living, Loving, and Learning, was a collection of basically of his speeches that he had given around probably either in California or around the country. And it, I was just blown away by it because I also felt like I was going to be an educator and um, to get my degree in education. And, and, I, and I would recommend that book to really uh-huh. any educator or really anybody that works in the church as well. It is so, so powerful. I also just wanted to share with you that this scene you talked about in Les Mis, um, about the bishop and the candlesticks is such an iconic moment um, in the show. And I've used that before. And um, I was in another church many, many years ago and used this in basically an adult VBS class. And um wow. And I really kind of push the case more, you know, that, that the, this is how God treats us and the bishop was representing you know, God. Mm-hmm. And then if either a few days or maybe a few weeks later, one of the people in that, in that class expressed their displeasure at, at me because, in, because obviously the bishop is not being honest in that scene. I mean, he's not being honest, right? He says, you forgot to take the candlesticks. I gave you the candlesticks. Yeah. Why'd you leave them behind? So he's basically lying, right? And, and in front of the, and to the authorities, right? And so the take on this church member was that this could not possibly be a God thing because God would not lie, right? Uh-huh. And, and I thought, well, I see what you're saying, but gosh, I just disagree with you that I'm going to use this scene again because it's so, because I think, because looking back now, you know, the bishop does not just represent God, but has the potential to represent all of us, right? Um, as you said, where are we in the scene? Um, which character are we? And um, I'm not going to advocate lying, but God, throughout the entire Bible, uses scoundrels who, you know, uh, mess up in much, much bigger ways than the bishop giving mm-hmm. those candles, saying that those candlesticks had been left behind and, it, you know, why did you leave it behind? And they're worth so much money, so... But it's always stuck with me how that church member just could not grasp the significance of that because they focused on the act of lying, you know. So, wow. yeah, and one thing that I like about the movie that I did not mention because it did not fit in at all um, is the person who played the bishop is Colm Wilkinson, who was the original Javert on Broadway. Oh, I did not know that. In the movie, he's the original Javert, or not Javert, he's the original Valjean, I meant to say. So there's a couple different versions, right? Is, there's the movie that's more like a musical. Is there also a movie that's not a musical? Or? Yeah, um, Liam Neeson plays Valjean in a 1990s movie. Yeah. That's really good. That's really good. And then the musical. And then I'm sure recently there was a miniseries. Now, have you read the book? 
I did in high school. I'm sh- it was the abridged version. Uh, it's pretty, <laughs> it's a original. pretty big book. Yeah, it's, pretty thick. I haven't, um, I, I read that. And my teacher in high school was a um, fan of the musical. So anytime we'd, re- anytime we'd read a part that had a song attached to it, she would play that song in class. And it was, um, and that's kind of, and then we saw the, um, we saw the touring of Les Mis for my mom's birthday present when I was in high school we went and that awesome. was the first time I really got to see it. Awesome. Oh uh, yeah. Well, Philip, thanks so much for being with us for this Excellent. series. We really appreciate it. And, um, you have a great, have a great weekend. Excellent. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Uh, how wonderful to hear from Philip again. Uh, please join us in the singing of welcoming God and listen for the shout out for Zacchaeus. Um, I ask that you all join us in our time for the prayers of the people. Filled with the Holy Spirit, we join with the church in every place, praying for the world that God so loves. Loving God, we pray for your church here and around the world. Sustain all who have tasted the bread of heaven. Teach us to forgive one another in love and build each other up. God of love, hear our prayers. Loving God, save and protect your creation. Feed, nourish, and encourage all living creatures and teach us to practice faithful creation care and to do our part as children of God. Loving God, hear our prayers. Loving God, you love all nations. Lead all people to seek truth and kindness to one another. 
walking in paths of justice and peace. God of love, hear our prayers. Loving God, we pray for those in need, comfort those who mourn, encourage, uh, uh, encourage the fearful, and tend to the sick. Use our hands and feet to bring healing and comfort for those in need. God of love, hear our prayers. Loving God, we pray for those gathered here today. Feed us well so that we, um, so that the, diffi the difficult journey of life may not be too much. And sustain us through the times of trial. God of love, hear our prayers. Loving God, we bless you for the lives of the faithful and the not so faithful ones who have gone before us. Be with those who mourn. May we continue to build on the legacy of our ancestors. God of love, hear our prayers. Loving and gracious God, we, lo we look to you in hope and trust, knowing that you will do far more than we can ever imagine. Through Jesus, our sibling and friend, amen. Amen. Each week we've been reminding you um, of the importance of your um, support of the church, and we appreciate that, not only through the giving of your um, offerings, but your prayers and your presence with us, even if that's online for the time being, um, gifts and service and your witness. And I'll put on the screen in a little bit the address and um, website that you can continue to give, and we greatly appreciate that. Um, we've also been this summer talking some about our um, responsibilities as United Methodists here in Oklahoma to support the ministries of our annual conference. And um, last week, Lacey Kelly shared with us of her um, support and passion for CJAM, or Criminal Justice and Mercy Ministries. And today we have with us uh, Maggie Ball, who is um, an active member of our church, and uh, she would like to talk to us about her support of Oklahoma City University. Maggie? Well, I'm happy to do that. I've uh, been a longtime supporter of all our conference ministries, being the diehard Methodist that I am, but I have a particular place in my heart for OCU. Um, part of that's because it's my alma mater. It's where I went, did my undergraduate work a lot of those many years ago, and um, had a great education there, and uh, it's also where I heard my call to ministry, although I tried to deny it for about 15 years before I finally got after it. But then when I did get in ministry, I finally came back full circle to OCU. Uh, my last appointment in ministry was there, and I went there in 2004, which happened to be the centennial year for OCU. Uh, established in 1904, and those of you particularly from Epworth know that the first building for OCU uh, in Oklahoma City was what became the Epworth United Methodist Church. So there's lots of history and excitement, you know, uh, good feelings there. But since it was the uh, centennial year, um, it had a special theme. It was called Lighting the World One Star at a Time. Now, some of you remember that OC used to be the Chiefs, but we decided that wasn't very politically correct, so got changed to the Stars, so all the students and the teams were named the Stars. So that was the point of lighting the world one star at a time. So I was there 10 years, and what a joy it was to get to see so many students who came through there and who blossomed and, and found their special ways to be servant leaders and really did and are continuing to, to light up the world. And it occurs to me that we at Mosaic are benefiting from those stars who are lighting up the world that OCU has helped uh, bring into being. Jay, our sweet Jay, who leads in worship and works with our youth, 
brings joy to everything he does. And then there's Sierra, our newest member, who's pursuing the ministry of teaching. Addison, that joyful redhead who works with our children and, and uh, just brings a spark of life to everything she does. Sweet, tall, big, gentle Dexter who cares for our little bitty babies in the, in the nursery. And then of a little different generation, a few years older, Eric. Oh my gosh, who does all things technology and keeps us surprised of the different uh, groups that are becoming reconciling ministry groups and always there, you know, making our coffee for us. Some great day when we finally get to have a coffee hour again that's, that's in person and not remote. Always willing to do anything and everything. There are lots of other people at OCU, more of my vintage and in between, who are also OCU people who give lots and lots of leadership to Mosaic. But I'm not going to name them because I'll surely leave somebody out. But I really think OCU that you know has a history of of creating a place where people can blossom and can can become uh, servant leaders you know, what this world needs right now. So I'm happy to get to support it extra uh, as my way to, to do above and beyond my regular pledge. And I even wore my OCU shirt, one of my many ones, by the way, but this one shows up best. So anyhow, I'll encourage you to, to support our United Methodist University here in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City University. Thank you, Mackie. I'm going to put on the screen just the um, website that, oops, I think I just um, don't know if I shared the right screen. Maybe I did. Um, if you'd like to help Mosaic with our portion of what we give um, through the Oklahoma Conference to OCU, you can go to our website and you can see the amount that we owe. And I think we currently owe around $1,200 and you can decide any amount you want. And when you send that in, just mark that it's for OCU and we'll make sure that's applied then um, to what we um, are committed to giving. And in the coming weeks, we will be highlighting other ministries that we support across the state of Oklahoma. And hopefully you, um, if you feel led to give, you will be able to do that. And I know that times are a little bit tough right now, but we, we wanted to be sure people knew what ministries we do support and to sort of um, highlight them so that we could try to um, raise this money this year. Um, Maggie, thank you so much. I um, was smiling because your cat is in the window and the little tails wagging back and forth. Um, we hope you and Tony are doing well. Just thank you so much for coming along with me today and promoting Oklahoma City University. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. All right, we'll see you later. And I just learned that uh, Mary is also an alumni of OCU, so shout out. Please join in singing, We're Children of God.
Maggie, thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, they really mean, meant a lot. I'm actually here on campus now getting ready to welcome the new generation of stars onto campus. So um, it is a special place and I'm um, happy to help contribute to, um, to that. So thank you so much for those. Um, please join me in our sending forth. This is our church. We make it what it is. Others will feel welcomed if I am welcoming. It will do a great work if I work. It will make generous gifts to many causes if I am a generous giver with my time, talent, and treasure. It will be a sanctuary for social justice and peace if I advocate for marginalized communities practice, and practice peace in every setting of my life. Therefore, we shall welcome all to experience the radical love of God as together we create a beautiful community of justice, compassion, and faith. And I shall dedicate myself to being all the things I want my church to be. Amen. Amen. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching, marching. Ooh, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, marching. Ooh, we are marching in the light of God. We are living in the love 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 of God. We are living, living. Ooh, we are living in the love of God. We are living, living. Ooh, we are living in the love of God. We are moving in the power of God. We are moving in the power of God. We are moving. In the power of God, we are moving in the power of God. We are moving, moving. We are moving in the power of God. We are moving, moving. We are moving in the power of God. Thank you guys so much for being with me to help lead us in worship. Um, next week, um, Leron Chapman will be with us to talk about the movie Pay It Forward. If you've never seen that movie, I would encourage you to see it. And if you've seen it like me, but it's been a really long time, you might see if you can find it and watch it this week before Sunday. It is a powerful movie. The week after that, um, Jenny and Lacey are going to talk to us about the movie um, Frozen. So that, looking forward to that. Hope you have a great week. I've seen a few of you this week, and, and, and Saturday morning I saw a few of you at the church. It's great to see you. Uh, for those I have not seen in person, really miss you and looking forward to the day that we're back together in person. Um, have a great week, you all. God bless. And let this um, Chris Rice song sort of lead us out today.
ten thousand years, right, child.